Today, we are in Gabrovo, Bulgaria, home to the American violinist Heather Broadbent. She and I have our Americanness in common. We're, we are both American musicians who are living in Bulgaria. So for me, it's uh, a special pleasure to be able to talk to her today and to introduce her to you, the readers of Morris Bottle. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be together with you today. And I have some questions that I would like to ask you. Excellent. All right, let's get started. All right. <laughs> uh, what, what are the sort of two or three things that uh, someone who has absolutely no idea what you're about okay. needs to know? All right, two or three things for somebody that doesn't know anything about Heather Broadbent. Well, I'm a violinist. I um, fell in love with the violin at the age of three walking by a violin, and I distinctly remember that. So I, I've had a definite connection with the instrument since I was little. And, uh, you know, I explored that throughout my entire life. Got my degree at the University of Colorado, Boulder, and um, made, I guess, the violin as the center of, of my life and made that my. Um, my, my journey and um, performed professionally throughout the Chicago Milwaukee area and in the whole of those kind of states, Chicago, uh, Ch I guess Chicago's not a state, but <laughs> Wisconsin, Illinois, and, and Iowa. And, uh, and then currently I'm here in, in Gabrovo, Bulgaria, playing with the chamber orchestra here. So I guess that's kind of two or three things. <laughs> For those who have not seen Heather's online videos, uh, can you introduce yourself the way you do on, on those? Ah, okay, let's see, <clears throat> um, I have to think about that for a second, because <laughs> this last week I've been so focused with the, the quartet I didn't make any videos, so <laughs> I have to think, okay, what is my introduction on the, on the videos? Okay. I completely forgot. Wait, let me remind you. Uh-huh. I'm Heather Broadbent, founder of uh, Online Violin. Okay, okay, I got it. All right. Okay. Hello, I'm Heather Broadbent, holistic violinist, founder of Online Violin, and creator of Violin Secrets Academy, where I train violinists all over the world how to play their favorite pieces and enhance their current skill sets. Not only do I easily take violinists to the next level on their violin journey, I enable them to be transported to another world through violin performance. That's an inspiring introduction. <laughs> yeah, if I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> so what, do you, what is it about, about playing the violin that um, can do that for someone, can transport them? Oh, wow, that's a very good question. And, and, and it applies to I think musicians, all musicians in general, and even listeners of, and appreciators of music. Music has this amazing power, power in the good sense of the word, that can really take you from um, the depths of despair and, and you can rise above it. So for me playing the violin, there's certain moments of certain music where my heart just like completely opens up and you can be connected to, um, to emotions, you can be connected to time periods, you can be connected to cultures. Um, and it's like, it, not just even with music, with art, if you're looking at, a, at a, an amazing painting, you just get like absorbed into it. And so it can take you away from maybe <clears throat> the stress of your daily life or, you know, your, your concerns or worries that really, in, in my opinion, don't exist and you don't need to be thinking about those anyway, because it, um, it, it can really just take you to that place of, of peace. And, and not just... Um, not that just music and art, like the whole picture or the whole piece of music, but just even individual pitches, I think, can really take you to different places. Mm. But Heather, playing the violin is so difficult. Yes, it's very difficult. I would say it's one of the most difficult instruments, but you're a cellist, what do you think? Um, <laughs> well, I'm also a former violinist because, you know, when I was very young, I... I picked up the violin and immediately said, oh wait, it's too it, hard. It's too heavy. <laughs> it's too heavy. <laughs> I mean, 
and you have to hold it up, don't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's a very unnatural way to hold an instrument. You have this arm, you know, like underneath and twisted, your wrist is twisted completely. I mean, you, you don't, what, what else do you do in your life that's like this? Nothing. And, you know, the bow arm is a little bit more, feels a little bit more natural, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a very, very difficult instrument to learn. So I have a saying that I say, I say, you know what, if the violin was easy, everybody would be playing it. So, <laughs> so, so how do you make the violin more approachable? I actually have a very, I, I, this is one of my passionate subjects because, um, because it doesn't have to be so difficult. If you have a desire and a sincere interest in learning the violin, you have this connection, I actually say the violin has called you. If you feel like um, you want to play the violin or you just hear the instrument and it just makes your heart sing and you have a sincere desire, the violin has chosen you to play. Uh, the voice has chosen you to play, and this could be applied to all instruments as musicians or artists if you feel inspired to pick up a paintbrush. Um, there's something inside of you that's saying, hey, you have a gift and you need to kind of you know, to work on this gift. So, um, so my passion is getting, like when I work with my students, I like to get in their head and think, okay, why is this difficult? Because there's a lot of times that it's just a mind shift. You just think about it just a little differently and you can do it. And so, not to say that you don't have to practice hours on end to, to make it work, but if you practice efficiently and be completely aware, you will progress a lot faster than if you say practice two, three hours a day and you're just like not really knowing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But how does it work with, uh, I mean, the, the traditional teacher-student uh, individual lesson, you, you go to the, the studio, mm -hmm. you meet with the teacher once a week, I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that the way violin lessons usually work? Yes. So, so <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, That's how I study the violin. But uh, what you're doing isn't quite like that. Yeah, I have a, a, a non. Kind of, you would have to say right now it's non-traditional kind of what I'm doing in um, in the in the music world. Um, and how it all started was when I came here to play with the Gabriel Chamber Orchestra as a, as a guest and left the States, my students still wanted to see me for lessons. Imagine that, I don't know why. The first, <laughs> the first year I was like, no, uh -uh, um, it's not gonna work. Online lessons, it's just, you know, I really had a wall with online lessons because I was a traditionalist. You know, you don't learn a musical instrument online. <laughs> <laughs> and the same student, she was really a sweetheart. Uh, her father was in the military, so she was very used to Skype and, mm -hmm. and online conversations. So finally, the next year, she begged and pleaded. She was, I think, nine years old, nine or 10 years old. And I was like, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Just because of her, I gave it a try. And we did violin and piano, actually. She was taking piano lessons for me as well. And I was amazed. I was amazed at her progress, her focus, and, because it was a lot more intense online than in, in um, actual in-person lessons. Mm -hmm. So, but with doing this, I kind of uh, approached other students saying, you know, while I'm away, if you want online lessons, we can give it a try. And so we did. And then it came to the point that even when I was in the States, the parents were like, oh, you know what, we don't have to drive our students to the lesson. They can just do it here on the computer. So even when I was in the States, they chose to have these online lessons. And I have to have another example of how kind of the videos have evolved. I, I started to make just some teaching videos um, from an inspiration of a friend of mine. And I, uh, when I was teaching my American student in the States that didn't, the parents didn't want to have to, have to drive and she wanted to stay home. She was really struggling with the A major scale and I honestly was at the point of frustration because it had been a year, maybe more, that I was teaching her the scale and the fact that she still was not remembering. So out of kind of a frustrated moment, I said, because I was tired of repeating it all the time, I said, let's watch the YouTube video. So while we were online, we popped up the YouTube video, she watched the video, and immediately after she watched the video, she played it perfectly. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. This is really pretty amazing. It saves my time. I don't have to keep repeating everything. <laughs> but more importantly, 
her brain was turned on. She, she was like maybe, again, like maybe oh, 11, 11 years old. She was one of the younger, younger students. And her, her brain was, was just turned on. And, and I have it like, I don't have like the, the documentation of this, but there is, the, the, the students nowadays are so turned on with online training, with Skype, with Facebook, with uh, YouTube videos. It's kind of cool to like, be, I don't know, just to see stuff on, online. So, so it, somehow it, it really worked. That was, that was a, a big, um, I guess, testimonial to me of the effects of positive effects of online training. So that was that was the beginning of the whole non-traditional journey that I'm on. <laughs> well, I, I would like to take this moment to to thank to thank that nine-year-old student for yeah. for really motivating this. This and and, and uh, it sounds like that was really the first breakthrough for yeah. you as yeah. as a non-traditional violin teacher. Yeah. Your students are of all ages, though, correct? Yes, they are. Currently, I, uh, currently, I actually have more adult students than younger students because I, I still have maintained some students from the states because now I'm um, in Gabrovo in Bulgaria, so it's been almost it's going on my second year here. So I've maintained some of the students in the states online, and then I've picked up uh, students from all over the world. And currently, I have adult students in, in England and and in the states, and students that have already finished their degrees at, at you know really really good universities but they just want to continue to, to have somebody to work with and they really uh, enjoy this and this works on their schedule and and actually what's really exciting for me that I have to share um, a couple weeks ago I actually worked for the first time with a violist <laughs> and it wasn't that he was coming to me for viola lessons because he, he he's he's an excellent violist he's actually wanting just some advice as a musician, because sometimes the musician journey, the creative's journey, can be really kind of oppressive, and we can get these negative thoughts in our head, we're not good enough, we can't do this, but it's really resistance that's keeping you from sharing your gifts with the world. So, one thing that I realized in my own journey is something that's inspiration to me, inspirational to me, is that it's not about me. It's it's not about um, you know. Once I realized it's not about me, about my ego, about um, about uh, I, I don't feel good enough about doing this. I, I this isn't perfect. I can't do this. I can't share this because it's not good enough. Once I got over that, um, then I realized, and I guess it's kind of a interchangeable. I have a gift that to share with people and. Um, and once you realize that you have this gift that needs to be shared, and that's more important than any negative thought that can be in your head, then that's then those negative thoughts disappear, and you push forward and break through your barriers. So that's something I, I really talk with um, with my students in general uh, to help them get over that black oppressive cloud of negativity that we put on ourselves. Mm -hmm. that, that sounds like a mission that really really does transcend any. Uh, any means of achieving that. I mean, it could be the violin, it could be something else, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be music. Absolutely, yeah. It could be any aspect of, of your life. You know, a lot of times we just have that negative self-talk that really is holding us back. Um, and uh, it could be in any aspect. You'd be a public uh, speaker, um, any performing artist, any, like if you have an interview, corporate interview, and you feel like you just... Um, you know, or nervous about it, that type of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've you've spoken several times about this idea of a journey, mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like your journey you see that as uh, interconnected with the journeys of the people that you are helping through music, mm -hmm. uh, helping find their voices through the violin. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could share some of your uh, what about your own journey. Maybe talk more specifically about um, where you've come from. How have you arrived? Is this is this your? Oh, very interesting question, Jeffrey. <laughs> I surprised myself. <laughs> uh, wow, you know it's interesting because um, I felt like I had arrived when I played in certain orchestras, when I played with certain musicians. I felt like oh, I have arrived, mm -hmm. you know. And 
and it was a really big deal for me. And then, I, I guess it's an interesting question because I don't think there is an arrival point. I don't, for me at least, I will constantly be trying to expand my horizons. Because and it, when you feel like a sense of arrival, it feels like, okay, here I am, ah, oh, you know? Uh -huh. And for me, I think I will constantly be expanding and won't really, there'll be, you know, senses of, and feelings of accomplishment and, but, but it will constantly be expanding. So I don't think I'll ever feel like I have arrived because I've, where I am is the current arrival point, maybe, but okay. that point is always changing, it's always uh -huh. expanding. Uh -huh. I, I mean, not that it's necessarily my place as an interviewer <laughs> to fully agree with what you just said, but uh, you know, it reminds me of the, I think there's a Taoist saying that the journey is the reward. Yeah, that kind of, exactly. Kind of idea. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really, it, it sounds like you are on this journey that, uh, um, I mean, do you have any specific sort of destinations along the way that you are, um, that, that you are pointing towards, that you are uh, aiming um, for? Okay, I guess the biggest thing for me is that I want to help as many people as possible with the violin, to, if, if that's, and not just with the violin, I guess, um, I just wanted to help people connect with their inner voice, and if that's through music, that's great. If it's through something else, um, whatever is their passion, it doesn't matter what it is, but it, that would be, I mean, for the bigger picture for me is just to help people in general um, connect with their inner voice and be able to live through that. And it sounds like the internet really is an effective tool for doing that. I, yeah. You know, as someone, as a musician, I'm, I'm very, as a, as a classical musician, I think I'm very traditionally minded. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised to, to understand it, that, in fact, this, this is an effective way, you know, with Skype, with, uh, you know, video instruction, that, that this, um, it, it really seems like this is, um, you are bringing this into the 21st century, to use that cliche. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's really exciting, because I never would have thought when I was in Wisconsin before I came here, I would have never thought I'd be teaching people in Australia and United Kingdom, I'd be talking to violinists in Bangladesh and Africa, I mean, uh, that would, if somebody would, would have said that to me, I'd be like, well, <laughs> what are you smoking? <laughs> <laughs> So it's very, very exciting to have students from, from all over the world. That, that's incredible to me, really um, inspirational. And the, and the internet is definitely the tool to help with that. How does your presence in Bulgaria affect how you see the world and how you... <sighs> Another very big question, Jeffrey. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, it's 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 life changing. I would say I, my first time coming to Bulgaria, I think it was two thousand two, and um, I cried when I left because I didn't know how, how I was going to be coming coming back because I loved it so much. I had an immediate connection with with the country, the people, the culture, and um, so I, I did come back through through music. Music actually brought me back here, and every time I would come to Bulgaria and then go back to the States, I really had a feeling of isolation in the States because there's a, such a large feeling of community here, at least like what I've experienced here in Bulgaria. Very, I mean, everybody takes care of each other, they know the neighbors, and it's almost like if you took the States and you went back, not that I would know, but I would uh, hazard a guess, maybe like 60, 60 years ago, um, maybe even more. I mean, it's just, it, it's... It's like a time capsule kind of here. <laughs> well, as a, as a fellow American in Bulgaria, I would definitely agree with that. that yeah. uh, you know, this idea of very sort of tight-knit neighborhood groups and mm -hmm. the, the, the feeling of, um, of really knowing the people that, uh, uh, that you buy groceries from. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it was really sweet a couple, time, a couple times that I was here ago when I had to leave. The lady at the grocery store, the little grocery store, had tears and was crying. Um, it was really touching.
touching. I mean, it's like you really have some amazing connections. I would, I would, uh, what I would say, if I had to say one thing, what it really made me realize is that as Americans, we have a lot. And we have a lot to be thankful for. If you're, you know, as an American living in the United States, you have a lot to be thankful for. And it's really an eye-opening experience to, um, to come to Bulgaria. And you definitely talk about connecting with your inner self. For me, it was part, kind of part of, if you want to say, an awakening. Um, I mean, it's definitely an eye-opener. Yeah. Do you also teach students in your, in your studio? that are physically present in the same room with you, do you? Here in Bulgaria? Yeah, yeah. I actually, I only have piano students here. Oh, interesting. Yeah, as far as music, piano and English, I teach some English students, but uh, yeah, I don't have any, any violin students here in Bulgaria. So you are both a violinist and a pianist. Yeah, I started, piano was my first instrument. I started when I was five, because my parents didn't know where I could start on the violin, and I really loved the piano, but not, I mean, there, there was, the initial connection was definitely with the violin, but I, I really loved the piano and I actually was going to, I was uh, preparing for auditions for piano at, for the university. I was studying both of them very seriously to, uh, together before the university and the university was where I made the, the change to, um, I wanted to do a double degree but it was absolutely impossible because of the practice, for me at least, for the practicing, the uh, there, was no, there was not enough hours in the days to practice both instruments. Okay. And it was just, for me, it was too much on my, on my wrists when I was mm -hmm. doing both of them at the same time. So the piano kind of went to the back burner, but I had a, a, enough experience and training on the piano to accompany all my students in the States. We'd have oh. two recitals a year, and I would play for my students in every single uh, violin lesson. And, and uh, so they had, it was a great experience for them to be able to play with the pianist all the time. So they were always well prepared for competitions and, you know, because mm -hmm. they, they, they definitely knew the other part. Right, mm -hmm. right. So you, you mentioned earlier uh, about your experiences with uh, different orchestras. Um, so obviously, I mean, your career has combined performance and teaching, mm -hmm. uh, something you continue to do, mm -hmm. uh, both, both aspects. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm try, I, I feel like we've missed some... What, what, what more is there to Heather Broadbent that we have not touched on yet? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a very good question because I, I love the violin, I love music, and it's a, obviously a very big part of my life. Um, so, but there, yes, yes, there is more. <laughs> and and what, what would you like to reveal to more Aristotle's readership and, and viewership? Okay, I know exactly what I want to reveal. I, um... Uh, through, <laughs> thank you, Jesse. <laughs> Through being a musician, being a creator, I have a kind of an interesting story. As a classical musician, um, we're really glued to the notes on the page. We're not not normally. Are you? I mean, you, you have your theory classes. I was taught by my piano teacher, you know, theoretically how to improvise. But I always said I wasn't. A composer. I had a cousin that was a composer, and I, you know, I'm I'm not a composer. I don't I don't do that type of thing <laughs> because I I built a wall. So um, just this last, uh, I guess maybe this last year, maybe a little bit longer, I started creating my own music. Uh huh. And it was a very interesting experience for me because it was it was an um, I was I broke down my own wall, my own barrier that I had with with creating music, and it was absolutely liberating uh, to have a violin in my hand and to play whatever just came out, and it was incredible. And I would I would also say in the past that I wasn't an improviser. So just to back up just a little bit, I I was kind of thrown into the fire when I played in a rock band, and I actually had to. <laughs> of this journey like you know I really had to work with other musicians that only played by ear so that was kind of part of it but um, what I've learned through my own process and uh, my own journey and especially this last year is the importance of creativity 
And I think it, creativity is underrated. A lot of people, you know, especially, you know, you, you, in the States, you finish your degree, you go into the workforce, you work, and it's like you really don't sometimes have an outlet for creativity unless you actively think, okay, I'm going to create or do something. You know, sometimes, in some cases, some people may feel like, uh, like, for example, I have a dear friend of mine, one of my best friends, um, who always said she was not creative. I'm not creative. I can't do that. I, I can't create. You're so creative. She'd always say, you're so creative, but I'm not creative. But the thing is, is that we're all creative, and we just have to kind of work our creativity muscles. Now, why is that important? The reason why it's important is because once you create something, and, and you can just create by saying, by creating a smile, just smiling at somebody as a creation. What you do, the first thing, you wake up in the morning, you put your, your feet on the floor, you get ready for the day, you're starting to create. So once you can first acknowledge that you are a creator, that you create this, your living space, you create, um, you know, if you have lunch with friends, you can create an atmosphere, if somebody's feeling sad and you help them to feel happy, you created that emotion, help them create that emotion, you know? So first is, the first step is acknowledging that you're a creator. Again, why is this important? Well, you start to build confidence and empowering confidence with these creations that you can create your life, basically. You can change. If there's something about your life that's just not sitting right with you, you don't feel right about it, you can make a difference. You can create your life. So I guess that's kind of the, the other part of Heather <laughs> that, um, that I've learned from my journey is that um, the secret of creation. And I think it's really a big secret that needs to get out. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you, Heather, for sharing that secret with us here at Morris Thal. <laughs> well, Heather, it's a pleasure as always to be able to talk to you and to really to, um, uh, to be able to, to share in your world because uh, I think what you're doing is so important and, and is, um, is going to be beneficial for so many people all over the world. Um, so for me, it's been an honor to interview Heather Broadbent from Morris Thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. <laughs>